and welcome to our online service for this Sunday. It's wonderful to have you with us. We're going to begin our service with an opening prayer. Be with us, Spirit of God. Nothing can separate us from your love. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with your saving power. Speak in us, wisdom of God. Bring strength, healing and peace. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. And so we have our first hymn. Christ is made the sure foundation. To our time of confession and saying sorry to God. Shining, surprising, graceful God, for running away from your love, forgive us. For preferring the safe, familiar and certain to the risky, unknown and mysterious, forgive us. For taking no delight in variety and insisting on sameness and conformity, Forgive us for fearing those different from ourselves. Forgive us for abusing your creation, your planet. Forgive us for noticing your presence in the darkness as in light, in pain as in healing. Forgive us. Set us free, we pray, to be whole and to live graciously without fear. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed. Forgive you your sins. Open your eyes to God's truth. Strengthen you to do God's will and give you the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together, God make peace within us and between us and grant us healing and strength to do God's will. Amen. And so as God's forgiven people, we say the words of the Gloria together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, 
you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We pray our collect for the 18th Sunday after Trinity. God, our judge and saviour, teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love that we may live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I hand over now to Nigel for our first reading which will be followed by our hymn, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. The reading is taken from Philippians 3, verses 4b to 14. Even though I, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not giving a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but the one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God, based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hand over now to Mike for our gospel reading, followed by our talk by Reverend Debbie. Today's gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went away. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated him in the same way. Then he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, 
you, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing to, in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and given it to a people that produces its fruits. The one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone who, on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realised he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the end of the, of the um, gospel. Praise be to the Lord. So let us pray. Father, may these spoken words be faithful to your written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, Jesus tells a story. The opening lines are full of promise. The story is set in a vineyard, and not just any vineyard, but one which has been lovingly cultivated and tended and protected. A vineyard was a very special place in Jewish times and it took on a certain significance when referred to like this in stories. A vineyard was an allegory for God's kingdom. So, once upon a time there was a vineyard, a beautiful and fruitful vineyard which the owner leases out to tenants while he travels abroad. As the owner is absent for the harvest, he sends slaves to collect his fair share. We might stop short at that comment. Slaves? In this story about the kingdom of God? Surely not. To own slaves is abhorrent. In Jewish culture though, it was legal for you to sell yourself into slavery for a period of time to pay off a debt. This system may well have been abused, but what the storyteller wants us to understand here is that the lowest of society is sent as a messenger. The messengers are not received well. In fact, they are beaten and abused, even stoned to death. The vineyard has been turned into a crime scene. And now our story is less of a fairy tale and more of a thriller. The owner of the vineyard tries again, but no slave messenger comes out unscathed. Finally, the owner has a cunning idea. He will send his own son. His son will be respected amongst the tenants. His son will be successful in bringing home what is due. But no. Instead, the tenants see the son as a threat, but also a means to a greater end. If they kill the son and heir, they will receive the inheritance. So what do you think happens next? Do the tenants receive the inheritance? No, of course not. The tenants are cheats, thieves, murderers. There is no way that the owner will bless them before killing his own son. Of course, this isn't a rather macabre fairy tale, but a parable told by Jesus himself. Often parables are difficult to understand at first and need a little time to mull over or even an explanation in order to fully understand. The true meaning of the story is blatantly clear, however, to the hearers of the tale, especially the chief priests and Pharisees who are listening in. The priests and Pharisees recognise themselves in the story, and they're not happy about it. They are being accused of murdering prophets, 
and they do indeed have form. They are being threatened that if they carry out the plots that they are brewing to have Jesus killed, they will be like the evil tenants. They are being accused of trying to swindle the inheritance of the kingdom of God from its rightful owners. And it is not an empty accusation. Just as they have had inconvenient prophets put to death, they have also made belonging to the kingdom almost impossible with all the rules and regulations that have been put in place. Sacrifices, tithes, rituals that need to be adhered to in order to be right with God. And let's not forget the plot to have Jesus himself killed. Claims are being made as to Jesus' true identity. Is he the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of God? Many are saying so. Whoever he is, his teaching is putting their way of life, their privileges at risk. As ordinary people listen to Jesus and begin to question the true value of all that they have been taught. The only way to keep their way of life safe is to get rid of the threat, to get rid of Jesus. They see themselves in the story, but they don't hear the warning. They carry on regardless, and they do indeed have Jesus put to death. The epilogue to the story gives another warning. It's an echo of what would have been a well-known psalm. The son that is murdered is just like the stone that has been rejected. Each will turn out to be the most valuable. The stone will be the cornerstone which holds the whole building together. The son will be the king of kings. Is there a warning here for us? It may or may not surprise you to know that we too are tenants. We are not the owners of anything. And that idea goes directly against the consumer, capitalist, acquisitive nature of our society today. In so many ways, we are defined or judged by what we own, whether it be the car that we drive or the clothes we wear. As we go about our daily lives, it's easy for us to claim ownership for ourselves. We might talk about my house, my work, my money, my life, my church. Yes, even our church isn't really ours. As soon as we have it in our minds that the church belongs to us, we risk having the wrong attitude towards it. Our church, whatever church that is, belongs to God. It is God's church. We are just stewards, tenants for this period of time. And we have to ensure that we look after it in God's way. We have to ensure that we are good tenants who welcome in those who God sends, whoever they may be. Not like those tenants in the parable we heard earlier. The tenants in the parable have the vineyard taken away from them. They lose their place within God's kingdom. It is given instead to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Times are always changing and yet the call is always the same. We must not put barriers between people and their God. We must enable people to enter into the vineyard. We must not allow it to become overgrown. We must welcome and love and invite. We must allow the vineyard to thrive. We must ensure that it is lovingly cultivated and tended and protected because it's God's. And because it is God's, it should be a glorious, accessible, diverse, inclusive, loving place which is open to all people, whoever they are. So let us be tenants who strive to follow the will of the owner, 
seeking in prayer and in stillness a deeper knowledge and wisdom of what God wants for his church. And then let us make it so, because it is in doing this that we will see the fruit of the kingdom growing and maturing. And so now we are going to declare our faith together with the words of the Creed. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hand over now to Alan for our intercessory prayers. Loving God, we come to you today as, as your church, part of the body of worldwide believers. Each of us so very different, yet drawn together through our faith in Jesus. We pray for those Christians who are struggling right now, for whom life is challenging. Without their faith in you, they would have no hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. We pray today particularly for those in Eritrea, we ask that those in power have a change of heart towards Christians. For supernatural strength, hope and joy for the imprisoned believers and their families. We ask, Lord, for the work of open doors to strengthen new believers coming to faith in such a difficult context. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, we pray for our parishes in the East Telford Benefice, for all those who worship and minister in these places. We pray especially for Reverend Debbie, Reverend Lisa, and our retired ministers, Reverends Lynn and Richard. We ask for you to anoint them afresh with your Holy Spirit and en enlarge their hearts to love just as they are loved. We pray too, Lord, for their health and well-being, physical, mental and spiritual, and for their families as they too make sacrifices. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them with times of rest, joy and laughter, that carry them through the challenges they will each face in daily life and ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray too, Lord, for all who minister and serve in this benefice, both in our buildings and out in the wider community. We pray for strength and wisdom and for your guiding spirit to be upon all who step out in faith to proclaim your loving kindness in these places. We pray for all those who come through the doors of these churches. We ask that whatever reason they come in, that they will encounter the peace and love that comes only from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of justice, we pray for the leaders of all nations. We pray especially for the government that leads this country. We pray that there will be work done that goes beyond the headlines, that difficult decisions that have been made will work for the benefits of the majority. We pray for fairness for all people and wisdom in how public money should be allocated and spent. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord of all creation, we give you thanks for the world, 
that you have created and entrusted into our care. We know that over time we've made mistakes, the ripples of which are being felt, often by the most vulnerable. We pray that you will enter the hearts of those who govern and make decisions, so that we can reduce and reverse the damage that's been done to this beautiful planet. Lord, we ask for you to speak into the hearts of each of your people. Encourage each of us to make changes that although may seem small and insignificant, will collectively bring about positive change so that we can live our lives in ways that reflect our love for you in our care of creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing and love, we bring before you those who are suffering either in mind, body or spirit, and ask for you to bring comfort in times of pain, worry and despair. In a moment of silence, we'll bring each, each of us will bring before you the people, places and situations you have placed in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all hope, we pray for those who are coming toward the end of their earthly lives. Hold out your loving hand and guide them to the way everlasting. We pray for those who have died in recent days or where an anniversary may fall at this time. Lord, comfort those who mourn, who will be forever changed through the loss of someone they love so deeply. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of all, in a moment of silence, we bring before you prayers for ourselves, our families and our encounters over the coming week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we have our time of sharing spiritual communion with God and those around us. At the Last Supper, Jesus, sharing bread and wine, invited the disciples to share his journey. Like many grains of wheat, becoming one loaf of bread the disciples were invited to become one body with him. Here today, though scattered, we renew our journey with Jesus and his disciples. Here today, we renew our unity with one another and with all those who have gone before us. Here, we renew our communion with the earth and the interwovenness with the broken ones of the world. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. Jesus says, listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Lord our God, you prepare a table before us, and although we cannot be present at your Holy Eucharist, by your grace, open our hearts to receive the gift of your Son, the Word made flesh, who on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, that, though separated by distance, we may still, through faith, be partakers in the benefits of Christ's offering of his body and his blood. This we ask through the same Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. We say together, Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. <clears throat> our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. A time of reflection now follows, as each person present makes their own spiritual communion with God. As we hear, I will offer up my life. This period of spiritual communion concludes with the saying of the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. 
as our Saviour has taught us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Remember, I am with you to the end of the age, says the Lord. We're going to have a hymn, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. to our notices for this week. You'll see behind me a typical harvest scene. And even though we've come out of the season of creation tide now, it is still important to be thankful for all those things that we um, are given um, and to pray for the farmers and to play, pray for our world and the climate change that is happening. And we will be doing just that, that most of this week as we work through experience harvest with our schools. So please do pray for those events and for the children who will come into Holy Trinity Rockwood Ironwood and go around six prayer stations looking at harvest. Um, also, we've got our harvest supper this evening at Holy Trinity Oaken Gates and we'll be having many school harvest services in the weeks to come. So please do continue to pray for all of those events and to give thanks and to do what you can to protect our environment. Deanery Synod is this Thursday at seven o'clock. If that applies to you, then please do um, check out the Zoom link and make sure that you can log in for that meeting. Bereavement Cafe is next Saturday from 10 o'clock at Holy Trinity Rockwood Ironwood and it's open to all people who have experienced a bereavement, whether that bereavement is recent or in um, years mind. Please do come along if you think that that would be of help to you. There's always plenty of people, plenty of cake 
and lots of tea and coffee. And if you want to explore how we can share our faith in schools or with the younger generations, then there is a day conference at Telford Minster on the 17th, that's Saturday the 17th, from nine o'clock. Conference is completely free, but you will need to book. Um, details are in our newsletter if you want to join in with that. And that's it, that's my notices for this week. I hope that you have a fantastic week and we'll see you again soon. We hope you've enjoyed our service today. It's been wonderful to share with you. But let me pray God's blessing before we go today. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And I leave you with the worship song Cornerstone. Do take care. God bless. Every heart.
Dressed in his righteousness and love, faultless stand before the throne. 